Hello, Online HUM 2020. This is Dr. Woodward. I wanted to record um, a brief lecture for you about some content that I think is pretty important to help you understand the speech by Socrates, especially in our first text, Plato's Symposium. Um, this first, in this first slide, I really want to focus on, very briefly, uh, the early speeches to give us a little bit of context. So as you probably have already read, uh, Phaedrus, our first speaker, um, really focuses on the social importance of Eros. And we can see him doing that. We can see how he does that because he focuses on how these amorous relationships uh, le lead people, both men and women, uh, to sacrifice themselves for the good of their lover. And he also mentions how this is uh, particularly important in things like warfare, which really highlights this um, idea that floats around in Phaedrus that there is sort of a, that Eros himself is kind of like a, a, a social glue that binds people together. So to move on to Pausanias, and, and that's definitely not the only thing to get out of Phaedrus, but I would just want to briefly hit on each one of these so that we can get to Socrates. To move on to Pausanias, Pausanias sees the same concept, that Eros functions socially. But what Pausanias points out is that there is a social disruption that is associated with one particular kind of Eros, and that is the common Eros. Pausanias is also where we find a description of the pederastic relationship, and specifically his point in his speech, is that this pederastic relationship is being abused. Um, I'm going to come back to these concepts in the next slide, so I'll skip over him for the time being. The next speaker is Eryximachus. He is a doctor. Uh, he emphasizes this balancing concept, the balancing of Eros, and speaks about the natural importance of Eros in the world around us, so that Eros is, a, is sort of like a life essence, almost like a life force that can be found in all, all living things, that, uh, that even goes down to regulating something like the weather. This is a curious assertion because on some level it does seem to imply that Eros has a similar function to Dionysus, the god of the life force. They began the speech by saying that they would not worship Dionysus. So it is curious that Eryximachus seems to kind of transfer some of that power of Dionysus over to Eros. It certainly um, begs a little bit deeper consideration and analysis, but important to remember as well is that Socrates is the real reason that anyone sits down and picks up this book. Plato writes this book in order to capture the speech of Socrates. So anyone reading this would have thought that each one of these early speakers may be partially correct, but isn't fully correct. That's the place of Socrates. So let's move a bit further. Oh, I'm sorry. One other thing I wanted to point out about, about Eryximachus is that he does convert celestial love into something that he calls moderate love. And you can see in him doing this that it is very important for him that this love has this balance concept, that it is moderate. Now to move to Aristophanes, I know that Aristophanes' speech, in spite of the fact that it is very strange, is one that tends to resonate with us as, as modern readers. There's something romantic about the idea of having another half in the world that you are able to find, and that love is pushing you towards finding that other half. Aristophanes brings up a point, as, as a couple of these other speakers have already done, he brings up a point that Socrates will eventually expand on. And at this point, it's important to remember that Socrates himself is not creating his speech, supposedly. Uh, 
Instead, he has received this information already from the woman by the name of Diatima. But it is interesting that, and here we have a, a clear suggestion, that someone like Aristophanes in his speech sees Eros as pushing people on a search. And it is interesting that later Diatima is going to say that Eros has that exact same function. Eros pushes the lover on a search. It turns out that the goal of the two searches are completely different, but the idea of being pushed forward on a search for something it seems to kind of open the door for what Diatima, who's not even at the, at the uh, gathering, is going to build on. Or we could say maybe Socrates is building on it and finding that truth somehow in Diatima's speech. But it is also important to remember that Aristophanes was a comic playwright. We may not be intended to take anything that he says seriously. It is also true that Aristophanes in his comedies regularly made fun of Socrates. And so that's something to remember. But to come back to some of one of the powerful and positive and important components of Aristophanes' speech is that he is the only one and one of the only writers that we know of in the Greek world who sees homo what we would call lesbianism and homosexuality as natural, as something already configured in the human beings if a, and, and you can read this and he explains it pretty it's a, it's a bizarre concept, but he explains it pretty straightforwardly, so I don't think I need to explain it to you. But that idea of the disc-shaped people who are uh, women, who is a woman attached to another woman, that those two will be drawn back together um, by love, by eros, because they are split off from each other, indicates that Aristophanes is suggesting that long-term same-sex relationships should not in any way be considered unnatural, but should be considered natural and divinely inspired. So that is an unusual thing. Now to move to um, dig down a little bit further into a couple of these, a theme that pops up, and that we should you should keep this theme in mind when you're reading Socrates, is a not a conflict, but a contrast, we could say, between the nature of something versus the effect of something. And this is very important to reading each one of the speeches. Um, each one of them, especially Socrates, draw distinctions between these ideas or these concepts. The effects of love, I think, are pretty straightforward. What does Eros cause people to do. The nature of love may be a bit unusual to us, but you should think back to Pausanias and how he suggests that there are two different types of eros. There is celestial eros and there is common eros. And his description is the description of a nature. This is a, a pretty important concept we would assume for the Greeks, that if your parents are a certain way or if your ancestors are a certain way, then you will be a certain way. You will carry aspects of them. You will carry types of behavior or whatever it is in ways that you don't even know. And that's the importance of your lineage according to what it seems to be according to this Greek um, frame of mind. And what they are suggesting is that Eros works the same way, that Eros is a certain way because Eros's mother, allegorically speaking, Aphrodite, is a certain way. And she is a certain way because her parents or her birth was a certain way. Um, as I believe I've mentioned in a slide somewhere, or maybe in one of my recordings, it is important to remember that the Greeks found it perfectly compatible to think of Aphrodite, for example, as being born twice, but still being the same god. Not a different god. There's not an older Aphrodite who is a different god than the younger Aphrodite. Instead, for some reason, somehow, 
These gods are the same. It's just that they kind of act differently. Maybe it's a little bit like a schizophrenic idea. We, as human beings, we could imagine the Greeks saying, we can't know the answers to these. These are the ways of the gods. They're not natural. They're not, there's not a way of explaining it. <clears throat> All we know is that, from the Greek point of view, this is the case, that there is an older Aphrodite who just so happens to have come from a fully male birth, and there is a younger Aphrodite who just so happens to have come from the birth of a man and a woman having having or a gods, you know, male god and a female god both having sex. And the older Aphrodite is associated with an older form of love called celestial eros or celestial love. In some of your translations it may be heavenly love. And the younger Aphrodite is associated with the younger love. And as Palzani suggests, because of the nature of these gods, they have from his point of view, specific effects. You should keep that in mind when you are reading Socrates, because Diatima will use a very similar explanation of the birth of Eros, yet another birth story, in order to prove that her point about Eros drawing people or, or pushing people along a certain path is true. That from her point of view, Eros is born of plenty and poverty, and so he is both filled with plentitude as a fully god, full god would be, but is also lacking, always lacking something, always missing something. And so he is in pursuit of what he is lacking. And from the philosophical point of view, his pursuit is equivalent to the philosopher's pursuit of knowledge. Now, they are correlated. So some technical language here. One of the things that I just explained, I've actually kind of doubled on this slide, but the first one, a demon, this is a component of Diatima's speech that she early on suggests that Eros is not a full god per se, that Eros is instead an intermediate spirit. And she has a couple of reasons for saying this. One of the reasons is that full gods cannot appear to human beings without destroying them. That is the case in the myth of Simile, the birth of Dionysus, that Simile forces Zeus to reveal himself to her and she's destroyed because his true essence as a god, will destroy her. Gods always have to change themselves into human beings, sometimes friends of the person they want to interact with, or animals, or something natural. Otherwise, they will destroy the human beings that they're around. So, love doesn't do this from our sort of understanding of it. Love operates inside of people all the time. And so that implies that that's one reason for thinking that maybe love is an intermediate spirit. She, she also explains how love, eros, lacks something, and gods are perfect. Therefore, if eros is lacking something, having a lack, it means that one is not perfect. And so therefore, eros, again, according to that logic, would be an almost god, but not quite. So, Eros is able to move between this world of human beings and gods, and that lack is what drives Eros in the same way that Eros's influence drives human beings to find some sort of perfection or completion. I've explained that idea of the nature and effect already, uh, and so you can, again, explore that a bit more in reading Socrates' speech or or we could say Diatima's speech. And the effect, as Diatima points out, is the pursuit of goodness. And remember this idea of the permanent possession of goodness, because um, we'll get to that. But before we get to that, I need to explain a little bit about this concept of idealism. Plato's philosophical system is often called idealism. And if I 
skip back to the previous slide, you will see here at the bottom of the slide the word idealism. Platonic idealism is a really complicated philosophical system that we can't delve deeply into. But I think it's a good idea to, to get a general sense of what he's talking about. So that hopefully will color your reading of Socrates' speech. Plato, as a writer, uses Socrates as a character to express Socratic and Platonic ideas. Um, and so one of the reasons for focusing on Socrates is that we know from other Platonic works that Plato is using, as I said, Socrates to express the, what he would feel is the correct idea in a, what's called a dialectical way. But to boil Platonic philosophy down into a, a few simple cliff notes, we have the, a, a terminological difference. Pla Platonic thought suggests that reality is not this thing that we interact with where we touch a table or a keyboard on a computer or we listen to the voice of our instructor or our friends or we smell the cake cooking in the oven, etc., etc. From Plato's point of view and from his philosophical point of view, that's not reality. That is a a world of the senses. From Plato's point of view, reality is permanent and unchanging. And therefore, by definition, the world around us is not his reality. Because our world is definitely not permanent and definitely not unchanging. So what he does is he splits these two worlds between the real, or what will eventually be called the realm of forms, and the sensible world, or the, you could say the realm of the senses. This is important for understanding how knowledge works, for, for Plato's point of view. Plato rather controversi controversially, and this is not a a generally believed idea even in contemporary philosophy, suggests that we cannot get knowledge through the senses. That we can only achieve knowledge through approaching this realm of permanent forms. For example, goodness itself. That's the only way we can really achieve knowledge. That any knowledge we achieve in the sensible realm is not permanent, and always changing. And so if it's all, not permanent and always changing, again, by a, by a definition, Plato would suggest, it can't be knowledge. Um, so the way of achieving knowledge, as I have here, is through the intellect. Now, another term, as we have already seen, and we'll see, you will see over and over again when you're reading uh, Socrates, is this idea of goodness. Goodness is part of the realm of forms. It is something, from Plato's thought, that is timeless, that is unchanging, that is always there. And it may appear, it may sort of appear as like a shadow in things that we think on this earth are good, but it's just a shadow in those things. Instead, it can only exist in this realm of forms, kind of almost like a divine realm. Um, for those who do subscribe to some of the Judeo-Christian Judeo um, religions, this may begin to sound a bit familiar to you because Christianity in its early phases borrowed heavily from Platonic thought as a means of expressing its ideas about divinity itself. So this realm of, of forms that are perfect, that are unchanging, is where goodness exists. And what Socrates' speech in the symposium is doing is giving lovers certain special access to a, a path 
towards this pure form of beauty, this pure goodness. This, is, uh, this split of the worlds, by the way, is often called cosmological and anthropological dualism in that there's a belief that the, the world, the universe, is sort of split between the realm of the senses and the realm of these forms, these perfections, like goodness and beauty, etc. And also at the same time, the human being is split between the physical body that we move around and some sort of intellect inside of us, which from Plato's point of view is able to connect to this realm of forms in a way that our, our bodies can never do.